is yours, uh, Shotan. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks to you for the introduction and thanks for the uh, invitation to speak. So yes, today uh, I'm gonna give two different topics, talks uh, about two different topics. Uh, yeah, there is no agenda for that. I just chose like uh, two, pap two papers which I wrote most recently. So the first talk is about uh, analysis and unitarity for cosmological correlators, uh, which is about a paper I wrote in August with Lorenzo Di Pietro and Victor Gorbenko. And I should emphasize that there is also like a similar or related paper uh, by uh, which appeared around the same time uh, by Matthias Foger, Boris Benetones, and uh, Cameron Vaziri. Okay, so let me start. So this is the plan of the talk. I'm basically going to talk about three main topics uh, related to some quantum field theory in DS, especially basic properties of it. And I will first start with introduction and motivation. And, and then I'm going to talk about some ADS Lagrangian description for DS quantum field theory. And then I'm going to talk about analyticity of the correlation function of the DS space time. And then uh, finally, I mentioned some unitarity constraint. So the first two topics are mainly about perturbative quantum field theory in, in DS space time, whereas the last topic is about non perturbative property of the quantum field theory in DS. And this last topic is, is the main overlap uh, with the paper uh, by Penedone, well, Hoge, Boris, Penedones, and Bazil. Okay, so let's start. So I think we, uh, we all agree uh, that ADS CFD is great. Uh, uh, first, like it can give us some access to the strongly coupled QFT using some classical gravity analysis. And also alternatively, we can learn about quantum gravity uh, just from like a, some QFT analysis. And furthermore, more recently, uh, it was not really based on uh, ADS CFT, but certainly many insights came and then people succeeded in some like uh, understanding uh, some properties of black holes, like the information paradox, like page curves. However, uh, we should keep in mind that we, do, we don't live in ADS space time. And there is actually like a nice uh, interview by Ho of Juan uh, that you can see on YouTube. I think it, it took place in ICTP. And he's saying that we got the sign wrong. Uh, what he meant is of course, uh, our universe is not uh, ADS, rather it's approximately DS. And there are two basically F uh, periods in which our universe was approximately yes. Uh, the one is the period of infla inflation, uh, which is the main subject of my talk today. And another is a currently current accelerated expansion of the universe. So, so of course, like because of this importance, uh, there have been a lot of works, especially recently about uh, DS, especially on the in the context of quantum gravity. So this is just my oversimplified view of various like approaches to DS. And of course, like there is one uh, approach which is like a more string theoretic and top-down approach, which is to construct uh, DS metastable vacua uh, using the string theory and the famously uh, give, uh, initiated by KKLT. And more recently, like uh, there are various construction which utilizes oriental planes. And on the other hand, on the other end, uh, so this, uh, there is more like a bottom-up approach uh, or like a, there, there is an approach which is more directly to directly related to uh, the observables and people who are doing cosmology are interested. And that's basically like a trying to uh, understand like, or do some computation using perturbation theory. Uh, so in this case, like a, you pick some theory and then you just do perturbation theory and, or like a, you, try to be more systematic. And then instead of doing the perturbation theory as a function of the cup, as a expansion of the coupling constant, you can also try to uh, construct the effective field theory and do the derivative expansion. And that approach was like a, a utilize it in the context, a lot in, in the context of inflation. And more recently, uh, there have been various attempts to kind of more systematically analyze the perturbation theory and with the hope of going a bit beyond perturbation theory. Uh, so which is often sometimes called cosmological bootstrap or cosmological, cosmological optical theorem. Um, but, uh, but 
both approaches have, uh, of course, virtues, but at the same time, uh, they have uh, disadvantages. And in this top-down approach, uh, one disadvantage, disadvantage uh, which probably everyone agrees, is, is that like, it's often hard to justify every detail of the construction because it often utilizes some strong coupling physics. On the other hand, uh, this perturbative approach is of course like by definition perturbative and also often, well, uh, uh, unless you do something like EFT and write down all possible uh, terms that you can write down, the approach is like a model dependent. So given this situation, uh, it's probably kind of like reasonable to ask or interesting to ask this question, uh, what are general rules of quantum gravity in DS spacetime, or ideally uh, nearly DS spacetime, because our universe is not exactly DS. So, however, if you start thinking about this problem, you will immediately like and realize that actually even a simpler question was not really answered, uh, which is what are general rules of quantum field theory in DS, and that's basically uh, the topic. Uh, of my talk today. Okay. So for example, like uh, in this context, uh, what do we want to answer? So there are like, a, uh, was there a question or what? Okay. Oh, by the way, like if there are any questions or uh, just like uh, uh, speak up and, and I can probably like try to write something more on the iPad and explain. Okay, so so what are like a possible questions that we want to answer in this context? So here we, I wrote like a two, uh, two questions. So one question that might be interesting to answer uh, is what is the consequence of bulk unitarity and causality uh, in late time correlation functions? By late time correlation function, I mean like a, we measure some correlation function of local operator at late times because that's related to um, directly to My something that we observe in the, in the current yes. universe. And so, and in this talk, I will uh, discuss something about unitarity. Uh, but the causality question is, although it's uh, very important, but I think it's right now it's wide open. Uh, what is the consequence of the causality in the late time correlation functions? So another question is that uh, I will discuss a bit more uh, in the next few slides, but given the similarity with ADS spacetime, it's natural to ask whether there is some CFT or conformal description of the late time correlation functions. And, and then if, if that exists, then like we could ask what are general properties of that uh, CFT? So those are a kind of questions that would be interesting to answer. Of course, I would expect that there are more interesting, many more questions uh, that's, that are interesting to answer. But uh, today I mainly focus on these two questions. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, discuss very, very basics of uh, DS spacetime, uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So this is the Penrose diagram of the uh, DS spacetime. And here you have uh, future infinity and here you have a, uh, uh, sorry, future in and here you have future infinity and here you have past infinity. And uh, there are three different uh, coordinate uh, systems or coordinate patches that people often use. Well, there are actually many more, but like uh, here there are three that's relevant for the talk today. The first one is called the global DS spacetime, uh, which takes this form. And this global DS coordinate basically like covers the entire Penrose diagram that I wrote here. And you can think of this as analog of the global ADS spacetime. And another coordinate patch uh, that's useful to uh, keep in mind is what's called Poincaré DS. Uh, and the Poincaré patch is basically, uh, Poincaré patch basically covers roughly half of this Penrose diagram. And the metric in the patch is given by this expression. And as you can see it, uh, it's kind of analog of the Poincaré ADS spacetime. And finally, there is what's called static patch, uh, which covers like a one quarter, roughly one quarter of this Penrose diagram. I'm not gonna write down explicit uh, 
metric, but uh, roughly speaking, uh, you can think of it as the analog of the Rindler ADS spacetime. And as in the Rindler ADS spacetime, uh, the physics in the static patch uh, appears thermal. And I'm going to explain why it is so in the next slide. Okay, so now uh, when you discuss the physics in DS spacetime, uh, it's not enough to just specify the metric because uh, DS spacetime is really like a time dependent background. And you really need to specify what kind of state you need to talk, you want to talk about. And the state we people often talk about in this context is the is what's called bunch Davis vacuum. And this is a kind of like a state that can be defined in any interacting quantum field theory. And this and it's distinguished by the fact that it's invariant under the DS isometry. And if you just consider the free theories, then there are also other class of states, what's called alpha states. But uh, as far as I know, like uh, there is no systematic way to generalize alpha states to interacting quantum field theory. So what? So let me now discuss why bunch Davis vacuum is such a nice state. So it is a very nice state just because it has a very clear geometric definition. So the idea is as follows. So here you have like half of the Penrose diagram that I drew in the previous slide. And then uh, the idea is to analytically continue this uh, Lorentzian spacetime into a sphere. And concre more concretely, we take global DS spacetime, so the metrics like this, and then do the analytic continuation like this. So, and after the analytic continuation, you can see that you actually get the metric of the sphere. And the bunch Davis vacuum is defined by uh, doing the pass integral on this hemisphere. And if you do the pass integral on this hemisphere without any operator insertion, and that is going to give you the bunch Davis vacuum state uh, on this uh, constant time, like constant space like surface. And <clears throat> so, so in this analytic continuation, I should mention that uh, this direction theta on the sphere, which is not periodic, which just which goes from zero to pi, gets analytically continued to the global global ADS uh, time, which is tau. But a uh, nice thing about this picture is that there is also like a different analytic continuation. So instead of like a analytically continuing this direction, you can analytically continue in this direction, which in the original sphere uh, is a is a periodic direction. And if you do the analytic continuation of this coordinate, then you naturally end up uh, with the static arch coordinate. And that's roughly like an intuitive reason why we get the thermal uh, physics in static patch. So the reason is because we are analytically continuing the periodic direction, uh, which is very much like uh, what, you, what you will do uh, when you compute some Lorentzian correlators in thermal field double. Okay, so, so far I talked about two different uh, coordinate patches, uh, global DS coordinate and then uh, static patch using this geometric definition. Uh, but as you, as I said, like uh, there is yet another uh, coordinate patch, which is as important as the other one. Uh, that is the Poincaré patch. So the, as I said, metric is given by this expression. So, so the good thing about the Poincaré patch is that the Poincaré patch basically suggests some nice relation with the ADS spacetime space -time rather than sphere. So this is kind of obvious if you just look at this uh, uh, coordinate. And if you take this metric and then do this analytic continuation, z equals plus minus i eta, uh, well, there, I should emphasize that there is a plus minus choice. But in either case, you get uh, AD minus ADS metric, which is minus uh, dz squared plus dx squared over z squared. So, so this suggests that there might be some nice relation between ADS and ds. And in particular, uh, the late time, uh, eta equals zero. So I, I didn't say it very clearly, but eta runs from uh, minus infinity to zero. And so eta equals zero is the late time. Uh, and this eta equals zero uh, surface uh, after the analytic continuation corresponds to z equals zero in the ADS spacetime, which we know to be on the boundary of ADS spacetime. So 
it's natural to ask, maybe there might be some late, uh, CFT description of this daytime physics. Or more precisely, because we are considering conformal, sorry, the quantum field theory in DS rather than quantum gravity in DS, uh, if there is some kind of conformal description, that conformal field theory should not have stress energy tensor. So maybe we have some like a non-local conformal field theory, some which sometimes people call conformal theory by dropping F. However, uh, so this naive expectation, uh, we should be, uh, when we talk about it, we should be very, very careful because there is a very important difference between ADS physics and DS physics. Uh, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So what is the main difference? So in ADS, so let's remember what we are doing, what we do in the ADS CFT. So in ADS CFT, uh, we take ADS spacetime. So this is the, like a cartoon picture of ADS spacetime. And then we put some scalar field in the bulk. And then furthermore, we need, because there is a boundary, we need to fix the boundary condition. So, uh, the actual uh, definition of the boundary condition is a little bit more complicated because we need to look at the fall off of this phi near z equals zero. But conceptually, what we are doing is that uh, we impose some kind of boundary condition uh, at z equals zero, and in particular, it I and then identify it with some uh, parameter j. And then if you do, do the pass integral with that boundary condition, that is going to give you the CFT partition function with a source term J. So more explicit, written more explicitly, you get this expression. So this J is something that you determine by the boundary condition. And this O is operator in CFT, which is due to phi. So in some sense, like ADS problem is a boundary value problem. However, in DS, uh, that's not what we are going to do. So as I said, uh, what we are going to do is to just define the state, prepare a state, uh, which is a bunch, bunch of Davis vacuum, then just let it evolve until late time, eta, eta equals zero, and then compute observables. In particular, uh, one big difference is that we are never going to fix uh, the field configuration at eta equals zero. So this is a crucial difference from uh, ADS uh, CFT. And in other words, uh, DS, in DS, what we are going to solve is the initial value problem. Okay. So this difference can be also seen in the pass integral formalism. So in DS uh, context, what we need to do is to do the pass integral along the Schwinger, what's called schwinger kirchhoff contour or in in contour. So you prepare first the state and Brian Kett and then let it evolve and then uh, evaluate, insert some operator and then like a sandwich that operator with time evolved bra and time evolved cat. That's what we are going to do now when you want to compute uh, the correlation function at late time. And in pass integral, uh, it's described by this like a time folded contour. You start from this a time equals zero and then it, Evolve, evolve to late time and then comes back. And so as you can see, like this is clearly different from ADS CFT because we, uh, so this late time point is really in the middle of the past integral. So we are never going to fix some field configuration here. But of course, if you really want to fix the uh, time uh, field configuration here, there is a way. Basically, we just basically need to cut this uh, contour into two halves. And then uh, sum over or integrate over all possible field configuration later. And this is basically uh, just a different way of doing the computation and the computation of the correlation function, and which corresponds to uh, computing the correlation function using the wave function. This is because like this part use like a time evolve uh, cat and then like a fix the bound uh, fix the field configuration and that pass integral is going to give you some a wave function psi of j, whereas this part is going to give you the wave function of psi star of j. And then we are inserting some operator, which is functional of j, and then integrating over j. And that is basically a slightly different way of doing the part, uh, computation of the correlation function. So now, uh, once you introduce the wave function, 
then you can uh, start talking about the similarity with the ADS CFT. And that's precisely what Strom and Jernomal de Sena proposed. And in particular, like uh, the details are was details were clarified in the paper by Maldesena. And so the proposal is that uh, take wave function and that is going to give you by, by some, uh, some CFT, although we don't know what CFT that is, uh, and with a source term J. And the source term, you, uh, and you identify the source term with the argument of the wave function. And more explicitly, uh, that this uh, generating function of the CFT has a, this expression. So, so let me just like uh, write one picture uh, to emphasize the difference. So in the wave function computation, indeed you uh, start from some state and then fix the uh, uh, boundary condition. And that's why uh, there can be some direct relation to the ADS CFT or direct anal analogy with the ADS CFT. Whereas if you really want to compute the correlation function, you need to prepare bra and cat and then uh, integrate over all possible field configuration here. So if we, if I were to write, draw some picture, I would draw something like this. You prepare two DS space time and then glue, glue it together. Okay, so, so let me just make several comments about this DS CFT. So, so the first comment is about this wave function. Uh, so the strong in Jamal proposed that there might be some CFT description of this wave function. But uh, I should say that so far, there is no concrete example in kind of standard quantum gravity, uh, except for a higher spin gravity or lower dimensional gravity like JT gravity. And in the context of higher spin gravity, uh, there is a very interesting paper uh, by Dio and his collaborators in which uh, they actually constructed uh, this, C not just this CFT, but also constructed some CFT that directly describes the correlation function. <clears throat> and another comment is that, although there is no concrete example in the usual quantum gravity, uh, if you take like some quantum field theory in DS and perturbatively compute this wave function, then you always get a structure consistent with the uh, CFT partition function. So from the bottom up, up approach point of view, like a, this kind of relation is uh, already like a, well checked, I would say. Now, uh, yes. Sorry. Um, so is it now you have fixed J at late time boundary, um, yeah. but the wave function is also, um, I mean, it's a wave function per initial state, is that so? So it is like, are you fixing both initial and late time uh, conditions now? Or maybe I misunderstood, sorry. No, no, it, well, you are right. So we, I'm, I'm basically, so let me just go back. So I'm basically using this particular state now, uh, which is bunch Davis state. So, so in some sense, like a contracting part of DS doesn't exist, like the, the, this latter half doesn't exist. Like I just like a prepare a state here and then let it evolve in this global picture mm -hmm. and then measuring that state uh, by fixing the boundary condition. Ah, right. okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're not fixing J, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. thank you. No. Sorry. Okay, so, so this was the comment about wave function, but I should also say that, so this is the approach like people often talk about when, like when you talk about DSCFT, uh, because there is some kind of at least like a analogous relation with the ADS CFT correspondence. But at the same time, uh, this interpretation, like uh, of we relating the wave function to CFT is sometimes uh, conf confusing or like at least like raises some puzzles. So what is that puzzle? So let's say we want to compute the correlation, really correlation function, not the wave function. Then what we want, we need to do is to prepare two wave functions, uh, which are complex conjugate to each other and then insert some operator, which is functional of J, like an insertion of J or derivative of J, and then integrate over J. But now let's try to interpret this computation from the DSCFT point of view. Then what we need to do is really, really complicated. We take two conformal, conformal field theory, and now we deform it by finite source term, and then we integrate over the all possible source term. 
And this computation is super complicated and not even really a CFT computation because we use, because you start deforming the CFT partition function. However, if we are just talking about quantum fields here in DS, we know that the final answer for the correlation function need to respect the conformal symmetry because if you take quantum field theory with some isometry in a space-time with some isometry, the final answer should be a representation of that isometry. And one, the thing I want to emphasize is that this structure is completely not obvious, not, not at all obvious if you do the computation in this way. So now comes the question. So is there a way to see the conformal structure of the correlation function more directly? And there is an answer, and that's what I would like to explain today. And that's the answer is that there is actually, uh, you can write a Euclidean ADS Lagrangian with twice number of fields uh, as compared to the DS1. And that Lagrangian automatically reproduces the perturbative expansion of the correlation function in DS spacetime. And this is valid, at, at least in the perturbation theory. And it compactly summarizes various important findings in the literature. In particular, uh, there have been recently a heroic efforts made by Slade and Tarana, who uh, systematically computed various uh, written diagrams in DS and found a relation between, uh, especially found a relation between Euclidean ADS written diagrams and DS diagrams uh, at tree level. Okay, so let me explain that. So. So the idea is actually very simple. We again go back to this uh, uh, in-contour in formalism uh, because that's what we need to do if we want to compute the correlation function. And let's say we do the perturbation theory using this in-in formalism. And then uh, when you do the perturbation theory, because you this contour is folded, you basically have two copies of quantum field theory. But I should emphasize that the two uh, I'm writing here is actually different from the two uh, I wrote here. And I'm going to explain why it is so. But anyway, so let me uh, proceed. So we have two copies of quantum field theory and depending on, uh, on whether the field light, uh, is on the left contour or the, on the right contour. And if you start doing the perturbation theory using this uh, two copies of QFT, then all the diagrams are decorated by left and right because the vertex can either live on the left or right. So for example, if I draw the Feynman diagram for phi cube theory, then uh, there are various choices. So we can put like a left or a right for each vertices. And as you can see in this picture, uh, it's clear that the building blocks of this di of these all these diagrams are basically a different propagator. The, the one which connects left, left, and the one which connects left, right, and so on. And what are these propagators? So these propagators are basically, well, as in the usual quantum field theory, these propagators are basically the two-point function in the free theory. But here, what's important is that is the time ordering. So if you choose left to left, then uh, the time ordering of the fields is the same as the uh, ordering of the pass integral. So naturally, the propagator is given by the time ordered pass integral. So where eta is the time. On the other hand, if you choose right, right propagator, the time ordering of the, uh, of the fields are different. Actually, it's opposite of the ordering of the pass integral. So that's why you get uh, anti-time ordered correlation function. And finally, if you choose left, right, then uh, uh, irrespective of the values of uh, times like eta one and eta two, the right field always comes later. Uh, so that's why you get this expression. And in the context of quantum field theory, this is often called Whiteman propagator. Okay. So as I said, so we have like a three different kinds of propagators and uh, they are different from by the time ordering. And in reality, uh, in quantum field theory, as you learned in text textbook, the difference of the time ordering is reflected in the uh, I epsilon prescription. Uh, because epsilon, the value of I epsilon basically dictates uh, the ordering inside the pass integral. 
And in particular, uh, if you want to consider the time ordering, then you need to correlate the time and the imaginary part. So you just need to multiply uh, eta by this factor. Whereas if you want to consider the anti-time ordered correlator, you just need to anti-correlate time and imaginary part. And that's why you do need to do the, this analytic continuation. And so this basically suggests that like a for a left, we do anal this analytic continuation. For right field, we do do this analytic continuation. And fortunately, if you do this analytic continuation, then the Whiteman propagator also works. Okay, so there is also another point of view of why we need to do this uh, Ipsum uh, deformation. So if you consider this uh, Lorentzian correlator, uh, as in the case of flat space, typically uh, there is a branch cut coming from the light cone. And this Ipsum basically tells you like how to avoid the light cone singularity. And in particular, in this particular case, uh, there is a branch cut coming from the light cone. And uh, if it's a left, uh, we basically need to consider a point here uh, above the uh, light cone. Whereas, uh, whereas if it's right, we need to put the point below the light cone. So now, uh, if we want to do some analytic continuation, so previously I said, at least formally, uh, you can do the analytic continuation to ADS by making ips, ips, uh, eta to i times some number. But if when you do the analytic continuation, we, we always need to make sure that we avoid the light con singularity because then otherwise the, uh, the structure after the analytic continuation gets much more complicated. And here, uh, because Ipsum tells you how to avoid a uh, branch cut, it also automatically tells you in which direction we need to do the analytic continuation. And more precisely, uh, for the left contour, for the left fields, we do this analytic continuation, whereas for the right field, we do this analytic continuation. Okay, so this is uh, basically analytic continuation that you need to perform in order to get the uh, ADS. Uh, structure from the DS propagator. And because we all know, we basically, we know like what these uh, propagators are, and they are basically just all given by a uh, 2F1 hypergeometric function. What you just need to do is to just analytically continue those 2F1 and then use some hypergeometric identity, the identity for the hypergeometric function. <clears throat> then after doing so, you discover that all these three propagator splits into a linear combination of two ADS propagators. And the difference is that like a, the coefficient is different. So here, like a delta is basically the operator whose dimension is dual uh, to the like a particular mass of the field. And more precisely the relation, well, let me just not write the relation because uh, it depends on whether we talk about, about the mass in DS or ADS. But let me just say that like uh, there are two possible operators uh, for a given uh, field with a given mass, depending on two different boundary condition. And then what you get is a two different uh, linear combination of two propagators. And this relation, uh, I should emphasize that uh, it was first uh, discovered by uh, Slate and Tarana uh, through the analysis of the melin barnes representation of the scat uh, of the DS written diagrams. And here I just gave some uh, more direct uh, position space argument. Okay, so now uh, we have this structure. So each propagator left, left, right, right, and left, right splits into two combination of the propagators. And so how should I organize this structure? And the idea is that I can introduce like a extra field. So initially I had two fields depending on field, whether field lies on the left contour, right or right contour. But now we know that each propagator splits into two. So we just like a, uh, increase the number of fields to four, two times two is four. And then require that the two point function of left delta and left delta reproduces this part, for instance. And whereas the two point function of left delta and right delta uh, reproduces this part. And whereas the two point function of right delta and right delta, if you replace left to right, then it should reproduce 
this part. So in this way, like uh, we can reproduce uh, these structure. And more precisely, what I'm doing this doing here is that I'm writing uh, phi L as phi L delta plus phi L D minus delta and phi R equals phi R delta plus phi R D minus delta. And then imposing this uh, propagator structure and that reproduces this ADS structure. And on the other hand, the uh, interaction term is always just given by phi left or phi right. So it's always uh, given by this linear combination. So now we have four different fields, uh, like uh, with complicated kinetic mixing and some interaction mixing. And in the step two, if you carefully analyze the structure of these uh, propagators and try to write down the Lagrangian that reproduces this propagator, you discover that actually two out of four fields are decoupled. And the ones that survive are some linear combination of left, uh, left plus right of delta and left of, and right of D minus delta. So this is the reason why I said like uh, the two fields that I'm going to talk about is not just the two fields that's, that is automatically coming from the schwinger keldish contour. It's rather some complicated linear combination. And in the step three, we just write down the Lagrangian using the remaining fields. And the answer is given by this expression. So you, in the final expression, you have two different fields, phi plus and phi minus. And I impose that this one obeys the boundary condition in ADS so that it reproduces the, the operator with dimension delta. For, and for this one, I impose the boundary condition so that it reproduces the operator with dimension d minus delta. And now the interaction term gets complicated because I rewrote these simple interaction terms using the field uh, in the... Okay, sorry. Um, using the field uh, in the... Uh, which survives in this linear combination. And this Lagrangian uh, is nice because it firstly, firstly reproduces and uh, extends observation made in well, various findings made by Slate and Tarana uh, for a tree level exchange uh, to arbitrary diagrams. Although like uh, they also like recently wrote a paper uh, which generalized their construction uh, to various different diagrams. And another nice thing is that uh, once you get this diagram, you can just basically forget about everything about DS and just do the perturbation theory with this diagram, uh, just treating everything as ADS. So let me just make several comments. Uh, as you can see in this Lagrangian, uh, one of the two fields always has negative kinetic term. So in some sense, like it's a bit like a ghost. Uh, this is not so much problematic in the perturbation theory, but of course, like uh, if you start talking about non-perturbative physics, then it, it's something you need to worry about. And if you really want to make sense of this uh, Lagrangian at the non-perturbative level, then you need to carefully specify the contour along which you integrate over, you pass into, you do the pass integral. So, so the, just to understand uh, clarification, yeah. so the are you delta now is allowed to take these principal series values uh you, yes so would it be imaginary in that case the coefficient of the kinetic term or is it still negative uh, real it's imaginary yeah because okay. it's like i times sinh right ah, so it's if not necessarily take... negative it's just non it's not necessarily positive and real right it's right so if you if you consider the one in the complementary series then one is positive and one is negative okay thank you Right, so it's, it's not just like a real or negative, it can even be imaginary. And as Dio pointed out, as a theory in ADS, of course, like uh, there are a bunch of I's and uh, theories are non-unitary. And again, this is not a problem uh, in perturbation theory, but of course we need to worry about non-perturbative physics. But, okay. But so far, like uh, we are just using this for the perturbation theory. And as far as I we use it only for perturbation theory, it is okay. 
All right, so any questions so far? So let's now uh, discuss the consequence of this Lagrangian. So we now discussed the con uh, relation to the ADS Lagrangian, uh, which is, yeah, the relation to the ADS Lagrangian. Uh, uh, so, okay, sorry, I got just, I just got some message in Skype and got distra distracted. <laughs> but, <laughs> so relation to ADS Lagrangian. Um, and so, so this relation to the ADS Lagrangian, uh, at least in preservation theory, tells you some uh, structure of the late time four point function. As in particular, you you can say some you can say that it must have some kind of similar structure as the boundary four point function in ADS space time. So, what is that structure? So, the structure that I'm that I particularly want to emphasize is the conformal block expansion. So, let's take the late time four point function. So you put like four operator at eta equals zero and then compute the correlation functions. And in the, in the DS space time, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit later, well, in, in soon in the next topic, but in the DS space time, just from the uh, point of view of unitary representation, uh, we expect that it admits this kind of expression where you integrate over, uh, so that you decompose the four point function as an integral over what's called principal series representation of a conformal group, which is a unitary representation from the point of view S. And then you have some like a part uh, analog of conformal block, which people often call partial wave. So, so this is, uh, if you just know that the theory is living in ADS, this is the best thing you can do. And in particular, uh, there is some function C delta of delta, but uh, the unit, uh, the representation theory of the DS space time doesn't tell you whether what kind of function C delta is. It's, it's, in particular, we don't know if it's meromorphic or it has branch cuts and so on. However, uh, since we mapped everything to ADS, so at least in, at the level of the perturbation theory, we know uh, just from the knowledge from the ADS perturbation theory that this C of delta uh, is a meromorphic function. And in particular, because it's a meromorphic function, you can basically uh, just deform the contour and pick the contribution uh, from the poles. And that gives you, uh, right, that gives you, okay, sorry, that gives you the discrete sum over the conformal block, uh, which is given by this expression. And so this discrete series is like something that you often see in the conformal block expansion of the conformal field theory, but it's not guaranteed to exist in the context of DS, a four point function. And so, so this, so in, in some sense, like a, this is some a new structure uh, that emerges because of the relation to the ADS Lagrangian. And given this structure, uh, it's kind of interesting to ask what is the physical interpretation? So in ADS space time, uh, this sum over discrete sum, this discrete sum has a natural physical interpretation uh, because, uh, yeah, because it has actually some interpretation as a summing over states in DS. And so let me just like a, try to be brief about this point, like because many people probably know about it. So in ADS space time, you can just consider some uh, uh, like a fixed time slice in global the ADS and then talk about all possible energy eigenstates and then try to decompose the correlation function in the basis of energy eigenstate, which is discrete basis. And that automatically reproduces this kind of conform block expansion. However, in DS, such an interpretation doesn't exist. And the reason why it doesn't exist is that like this global DS, ADS picture is mapped to this uh, uh, picture in the Poincare patch, uh, in which like uh, you consider a, a state defined on this hemisphere. But this hemisphere is a nice space-like surface in the 
case of ADS, but if you I, if I draw the same hemisphere in DS spacetime, that's not going to be a space-like surface. Instead, it's uh, it's going to be given by some kind of mixed time-like and space-like surface, and you cannot really define the Hilbert space on top of it. So, so what's the interpretation of this discrete sum? However, uh, one interpretation that we uh, mentioned in the paper is that uh, maybe, uh, at least in the perturbation theory, uh, one can possibly relate this discrete sum to a sum over quasi-normal modes in the static batch. So roughly speaking, the idea is follows. So let's consider uh, the four-point function, late time four-point function, in particular the exchange diagram. And if I do the decomposition of the conformal block decomposition, then you see some like a uh, sum of a disc discrete uh, delta, and it governs the fall off in the large space like separation. So as I <clears throat> and this large uh, fall off is actually basically controlled by the two point function of this uh, operator, which shows up in the vertex. However, on the other hand, uh, you can also consider this two-point function uh, along when, when it is time-like. And, and this time-like two-point function also uh, exhibits some fall-off. In particular, if you put two, op two points in the same static patch and express, uh, express it in terms of the static patch time, and this sum over uh, discrete, series, discrete, sorry, this discrete sum has a very clear interpretation from the static patch physics, and it's basically given by the quasi normal modes, sum over quasi normal modes. So, this relation, so let me just repeat. So, the four point function, the composition of the four point function uh, is more or less directly related to the composition of the two point function in the case of perturbations exchange diagram. And this sum is in the two point function is related to the time like sum. Sum over sum for the time like two point function, which in turn is related to the sum over quasi normal modes. So, using this chain of logic, uh, one is tempted to say that this uh, OP expansion in this late time four point function uh, must be related to something like sum over quasi normal modes. However, if we want to make this very, very precise, we also need to discuss why, like a quasi normal modes, in some sense, uh, form a complete basis of states. And that's already a difficult question. So, and we don't have anything concrete right now, but let me just uh, make this comment and move to uh, the next topic, unless there are questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, yes. I'm a bit confused about something. I'm not sure I'll be able to express it properly, but um, so, I understand that you get this uh, conformal block and the conformal structure at the late time, mm -hmm. um, but the way you started with, with this in informalism, um, mm -hmm. where do you, where is it crucial there that you go all the way to the late, I mean, all the way to eta going to zero? I mean, could you not have done the, the contours so that you don't stop at, I mean, you stop earlier and therefore you have a space-like surface that's not necessarily um, late the late time, because then you wouldn't have conformal structure. It, it, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe it's not very Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand what, yeah, I understand what you mean. So, so the, okay, so this is a point which might become more clear in the next topic, but uh, the reason why uh, late time eta equals zero is nice is because eta equals zero is, a, uh, is invariant under the DSA symmetry, mm -hmm. whereas the eta finite is not invariant. Mm -hmm. and the sum of the isometry. Mm -hmm. So eta equals zero surface naturally forms a representation of the uh, DS isometry group. Whereas mm -hmm. if you consider Hubert space at finite eta, uh, it doesn't necessarily form a uh, isometry. It's, well, if you consider observable at finite eta, then it, it becomes more complicated, I would say. Yeah, that I understand. But precisely from your construction at the beginning, it sounded like you could have stopped. I mean, you could have turned around at any other it's a constant surface, yeah, yeah. But then, and then okay. you wouldn't expect a conformal structure, but from this, it seems you... Uh, okay, actually, like uh, I will talk about those observables uh, in the next topic, so uh -huh. you can indeed con consider that. But then like uh, 
It's just that the details of the conformal structure becomes more complicated. Uh, more precisely, there are cross ratios, more cross ratios, if you consider observable at finite beta. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then like uh, it's now a good time to talk about unitarity in the remaining five or six minutes. So now uh, I uh, switched the topic a little bit and now I'm going to talk about what is the implication of bulk unitarity. And so what is the implication of unitary representation of the DS uh, space-time in late-time correlation functions? So to discuss that, let's just remind us the simple uh, like a toy model, which is the two-point function in flat space. And let's remind us how the unitarity constraints give some constraint. So let's consider the two-point function. Uh, we put like a two operators here and there. And then I'm going to use this like a, a representation which relates the operator at x to the operator at zero using the uh, translation operator. And if I use the translation operator, and then use the and furthermore use the fact that the vacuum is invariant and the translation then i get this expression and now i insert a complete basis of state here uh, which are labeled by the momentum so like uh, for each momentum there can be several states so i just like uh, put extra sum over states and if you do so uh, then rewrite this a little bit, then you get this expression. Now, like because ins I inserted the momentum eigenstate, I can replace this operator into the eigenvalue, and then I get the integral over the momentum. And because of this structure, uh, the coefficient of this e to ip x one minus x two is must be positive in unitary theory because it's the square of something. So this basically tells you that unitarity becomes a positivity of the Fourier coefficients in the flat space in two point function. And the same is true actually for DS. So now we consider a two point function at finite eta, not at late time. And for simplicity, let's put two operators at same eta. And similarly as in the flat space, I can move uh, a point at X eta to some uh, reference point in DS space time by using some DS isometry. So this is some like operator representation of the DS isometry. Now, because we are using bunch Davis vacuum, which is invariant under the DS isometry, I can like run the similar argument as in flat space and arrive at this expression. So now instead of exponential IP X one minus X two, I have this combination, which is the generator. And then I insert a complete basis of state, which is like a, uh, given by some sum over principal series of representation plus some extra representations that, that also belong to unitary representation. And then uh, by massaging the expression, uh, so okay, so but first of all, I in, in, by inserting that, I get this kind of expression. And this expression basically uh, consists of three terms, uh, well, two terms, uh, one, uh, like a one combination which depends on the detail of, of the operators. And there is one in the middle, uh, which is just like a matrix element of some uh, DS isometry sandwiched by the irreducible representation of the DS group. So this is uh, purely like a group theoretical object and it's completely determined by the symmetry. And uh, you can actually determine this by the symmetry and that's also basically uh, gives you uh, some uh, DS harmonic function of DS propagator. And, and by doing so, you can see that now you see the same structure. You have some something that's determined by the symmetry times uh, square of something which is positive. So this gives you that, well, first of all, this manifests the conformal structure present in this problem. So this is so this is the part which is determined by the symmetry, and this is in some sense something like OP coefficient square. And importantly, this OP coefficient square is positive. And pictorially, what I was doing is like this. So I was putting two operators at the same eta, but uh, it's actually kind of convenient to consider this time folded contour and then put one operator here and, and put the other operator here. 
And this is the same as like a, the original picture we, in which uh, I put two operators here because like this part of the contour cancels out. But the reason I wanted to draw like this is because now I have 2DS spacetime if I use the uh, mapping to this picture and one operator living in this bra part and the other operator living in the cat part. And what I did in the previous slide is that using the symmetry, I move this operator to some canonical position. And this movement basically gives you some kinematical factor. And what multiplies the kinematical factor is basically this kind of pass integral, which as you can see in the picture is a square of something and it's positive. So this is a kind of like a very intuitive pictorial way of understanding the positivity constraint in DS spacetime. And <clears throat> right, so, so this is the uh, unitarity condition for a late time four point function. Uh, sorry, sorry. So and then uh, let's let's discuss the unitarity condition for the late time four point function. And basically, the idea is the same. Uh, now, instead of one putting one operator here and one, the other operator here, I can just like. Now I'm going to talk about like operators inserted eta equals zero, but for the purpose of drawing figure, I move the one and two slightly below and three and four slightly above. And then I compute this correlation function. Now what I'm gonna do is to insert the complete basis of state here. And that is going to give you this expression. And then uh, I'm going to find some, uh, some uh, group, some isometry of the space time, which maps x1 and x2 to zero and one, and x3 and x4 to s3 and four, like this. And this basically gives you uh, uh, this structure, uh, because now I'm again using the fact that uh, Bunch Davis vacuum is invariant under G, and uh, and then as a result, uh, we get this uh, something, uh, something square, which is positive times this function, which is given by G12 times G34 inverse, where G12 is the uh, DS isometry that, need, that you need to multiply in order to take points zero and one to X1 and X2. And G34 is, uh, R is the DS isometry that, need, that you need to multiply in order to take zero, zero and one to three and four. And this quantity is again determined purely by the symmetry. And you can even write down some kind of like a differential equation which determines this. And you can actually check that it gives you the what's called conformal partial wave. And in summary, uh, this means that late time four point function is given by this integral. So this part is a, a conformal partial wave which, determine, which is determined by the symmetry. And this C of eta, uh, is must be positive because of this non perturbative unitarity constraint. And the analyticity is hard to tell just from this argument, but as I argued before, uh, from the perturbative analysis in relation to ADS, you can say that it's a meromorphic function. And the generalization, and, and let me just mention that, like in principle, one can also construct, consider some kind of generalization which involves like a two point and three point by constructing this kind of matrices and requiring that this matrix is because uh, it is given by like a matrix of norms. So it must be like a positive definite matrix. So this in principle one should be able to write but uh, this hasn't been explored yet. So because of the time, like let me just skip some concrete computation and uh, conclude. So the conclusion is that uh, we proposed a systematic approach to relate DS spacetime and ADS spacetime, in particular in the perturbation theory. And we discussed the analyticity of the correlation function in perturbation theory and the unitarity at non-perturbative level. An obvious future question is to include gravity. And in ADS, as I mentioned a little bit, gravity, including gravity is just a matter of including T mu nu on the boundary correlator. But in DS, it's quite different because uh, gravity can fluctuate at late time surfaces and make the theory gravity, gra gravitational. Like a, even this like late time correlation function feels the gravity. 
Now, another interesting thing is that uh, I wanted to mention is that this, so in this analysis of the perturbation theory, we related the wave function computation to the correlation, sorry. We rewrote the correlation function computation into the computation of ADS, which is normally related to the wave function computation. So one interesting question is whether we can do the same in flat space. So in flat space, the analog of the wave function is S matrix because we fix like a future and late time uh, well, in state and out state. Whereas the analog of the correlation function is the inclusive of the row because we sum over all possible states at late time or maybe something like energy energy correlator. So if there is a similar story, then there may be a way to compute this inclusive observables uh, in the language of S matrix. And if that exists, it might be a bit interesting to uh, figure out. Okay, so sorry for going a bit over time. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sota, for a wonderful part one. We can all unmute ourselves and uh, thank Shota together. And so let me open the floor for um, questions uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, and then let everyone rest a little before um, the next talk at 4 p.m. So please, uh, if you have a question, uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask. Um, Shada, can you clarify a bit uh, the last point? W what kind of yeah. uh, analog are you imagining? Because here you were rotating from like between ADS and DS and uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that's that's the main question. Uh, to which space we want to rotate, right? Because like if you start from Minkowski space and just go back to the Euclidean space, that's the usual rotation, which is not relevant in this story, right? And one thing, one possible approach is to foliate Minkowski space time uh, as a D in terms of DS or ADS. So that's something that like, uh, sometimes people do in the context of celestial holography. And then like uh, rotate the DS part to say ADS. But I'm, I'm not sure if that really works and if that's really interesting, but that's one possible approach. All right, thanks. Hi, Shota, thanks for the nice talk. Hey, in your summary, I just got confused about, you had the summary of the four point function C of nu. Yes. That it's meromorphic and positive, but did you mean right. that exactly? Ah, okay. So it's, it's positive on this uh, imaginary axis, like in the axis of the principal series. I see, I see. And away from the principal series, it, it only has poles. That's, the, that's what I meant. Thanks. So on, on the imaginary axis, it's real and positive and then it's- Right, right. I had a question too. Can you summarize, how does it help you um, the comparison uh, with ADS? So the fact that you find a connection to ADS, in which way uh, does it help you in one line? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so this conclusion, we kind of like draw this conclusion using the mapping to the ADS because in ADS in perturbation theory, we know this is this to be true. And more at a more technical level, um, in some sense, like people also already figured out uh, the way to compute uh, DS written diagrams uh, like efficiently. But uh, the good point of, of our work is that I think we can just do it without thinking. Like you can start with the ADS Lagrange and then just do the normal ADS written diagram. Forgetting about how to relate DS and ADS. I see. Okay. So is it because you you find these ADS uh, two point functions in this in that decomposition you were showing? Yeah, that's the basis, and then like uh, I think, but that that's already like a in some sense done uh, by Slate and Toronto. And what we really did, the, the main point of our work is to write down, convert it into Lagrangian, which automatically generates all the uh, perturbative diagrams. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
So I, I had a question as well. So the in ADS, it's very natural to consider insertions of local operators at the boundary mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons associated to uh, radial quantization and Euclidean mm -hmm. CFD and state operator correspondence, all of which are rather doubtful. Uh, yeah, I agree. Notions in the con in the context of the sitter, and in fact, there doesn't seem to be any real principle uh, forcing us to consider local insertions on the future boundary. Rather, it seems much more natural to consider blobs or integrated, you know, smeared or or sort of distributional mm -hmm. type things, and that would lead to a different kind of observable than this correlation of local operators which would more naturally tie into the gravitational picture as well i would think because of diffeomorphism invariance i agree you have a comment about even in rigid desider computations of those kind of observables as opposed to the more canonical local insertions you're considering i don't have i don't have any comments i would say um the reason why in this work we consider this local correlation functions are like a it's more like a naturally related to the observables in cosmology right like people measure some like a, well even there they're fourier transforms which are sort well, of that's also localized. true that's true so i, yes, I even yes. disagree with that statement yeah okay yeah yeah Th that i agree yes well, right so from the partial wave what's that you can free it transform the partial wave you can fourier transform yeah but then you have to deal with, with with colliding operators and things like that. I just wanted, it seems to me very natural to sort of let go of this uh, ADS inspired local operation operator insertions, but but I, I haven't seen much discussed about that. I, I just wanted to know whether whether there were any just uh, any comments. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But um, yeah, so I think like, uh, Many advantage of, advantages of like using local operator is just, is just because we can use the uh, ADS intuition and technology developing ADS. Right? Well, and then maybe afterwards you can just try to integrate and convert it into no local operator. I don't have anything more intelligent to say. Okay, thank you. Um, so, can any I more? Oh, sorry, clearly. Okay. Sorry. Please continue asking questions. <laughs> I, just one question. So um, of these results, how, how much is it um, sensitive or, or dependent on the fact that you're using the bunch Davies vacuum? Um, and, or that's, a, that's a very good question. So I think many of this, well, first of all, the relation to ADS relies very much on the specific form of the propagator, at least the one I, I presented. So that is very much uh, sensitive to the bunch Davis vacuum and the story gets modified if you use the different vacuum. And this thing I summarized here uh, could potentially be true as long as the vacuum preserves uh, the SI symmetry. Right, I see. So at least the unitarity um, implications yeah. could be for other vacuum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. I shot a good question. Yes. Um, so, well, two questions, more like. Um, so, first question would be so, you present a construction where you have this doubling of field in ADS in this effective mm -hmm. Lagrangian for scalars. Mm -hmm. Do we know how much of it should hold for spinning fields? For example, I don't know whether you address, for example, the vector in the S, whether it works the same way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think ADS, etc. I, I think it's a good question, and I expect for for the normal like uh, operators, like a particle with spin, I think it would work, but we didn't uh, we didn't do it. But I think like uh, things might get a bit more complicated for the gauge field. Because gauge field, there might be some problems similar to like a graviton, and there might be some like IR divergences coming from the fact that like a, the gauge field fluctuate at the boundary. 
But as long as you talk about some like massive warp particle with spin, I think it's it should work in a similar way, but we didn't work it out. Okay. And just to be sure on the computation of these uh, mm -hmm. different green functions. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm looking at the time ordered, I should do of the cut in a anti time by. E, sorry, sorry, could you repeat? If I want to look at the different, so you've got these three propagators the time ordered, anti time ordered, and right, then the right, 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 function. Yeah, so, so let me try to go back to yes, okay. I think it's 20, yeah. Um, so the explicit way of computing you give the i epsilon prescription for the difference, yes. yes. And so if I understand correctly, you have, um, so if I want to time order things, I need to be slightly below the cut. If I want to anti time order, I have to be slightly below the cut. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And this, so, this is a picture. And so what's the status for the Weitman? Because it's, it's not anti or time orders. Oh, right. So the Weitman, so Whiteman involves like one left field and right one right field. Give it its value. Okay. So sorry. For, okay. Yeah, yes. Right. One left, one right. And then you just like uh, do this like a different. So, uh, okay. so it's a yeah. really a double limit. You have to consider how you yeah, move yeah. each insertion point. Yeah. Because each okay. insertion comes with its own eta. So. Okay. All right. I'm I'm gonna let informally formally close the session but keep the zoom on i'm going to stop recording now or pause okay so um welcome back everyone and uh again it's a great pleasure to uh have uh, shota komatsu from cern uh, give us a uh, part two of our triangle uh, meeting here at king's and in part two we're going to learn about uh, large charge and holography so Thank you from here, Shota. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Okay, so yes, in part two, I'm going to talk about a slightly different, well, maybe very different topic, uh, which is about large charge in holography. So, so the theme of the talk is to understand some large charge, interplay between large charge and holography for U and N equals for CPM mills. Yeah, I'm going to focus on the simplest possible holography example, which, which I love, is, which is n equals four super mills. And so the kind of question that I want to address in this talk is the, what's the counterpart of large charge EFT? So if you don't know large charge EFT, uh, don't worry, I'm going to uh, like a review a bit. And in holography and uh, another question is that what is the property of large charge sector in higher rank? N equals four super mills. By higher rank, you mean like a, the theory with like a higher rank gauge group. Okay, so this is a plan of the talk. Uh, so again, like my talk consists of two uh, different parts. And the first part uh, is about uh, general properties of large charge in U and N equals four super mills, uh, which is uh, based on the paper, which hopefully appears soon. Well, it's actually a matter of me writing the draft, but. Uh, it's a collaboration with Clay Cordova, Frank Coronado, Costa Zarembo, and for Russian names, Victor, Nikita, Slava, and Kolya. Yeah, I've been saying that I'm working with Victor, Nikita, and Slava, and Kolya, uh, but they are not, they might not be the Victor, Nikita, Slava, and Kolya that you know. Uh, they are actually amazing undergrad students in Moscow. They are really amazing. Um, and then, uh, the next topic that I'm going to, the second topic that I'm going to talk about is based on the paper that I put out uh, this week uh, together with Simona Giompi and uh, Ben Dugatz of Taylor. And I should also emphasize that Ben Dugatz is also a very uh, amazing student of Simona Giompi. Okay, so, so let's start. So the first topic, large charging N equals for super mills. So let me first review uh, what was large charge expansion in general conformal field theory, uh, which were developed mainly by Hellerman and his collaborator, in particular, uh, these authors, uh, Hellerman, Orlando, Weffer, and Watanabe. And there was also like a 
a nice systematic like EFT approach uh, uh, initiated by a group in APFL. So, so one, uh, so people recently started ask like, what is the uh, general property of conformal field theory when you consider operator with very, very large U1 charge? And one uh, important prediction made by these works is that uh, there is a semi-universal prediction of the conformal field theory data in the large charge limit. And more precisely, the most universal and basic uh, prediction is that the minimal dimension of the operator with given charge J in the limit where charge J becomes infinite, scale like J to D over D minus one, if you consider conformal field theory in D dimensions. So this is actually very easy to understand. You can easily derive it in this one slide. So let's consider conformal field theory on RT times SD minus one, where RT is the time direction, SD minus one is the sphere direction, is the sphere direction. So this is a radial quantitation. And let's also put the theory on a radius R. So this, this is the radius of the SD minus one. And in this theory, uh, using the state operator correspondence, uh, we can consider state dual to this uh, operator. And the uh, energy of that state is given by delta minus over R, uh, where delta is the dimension of the operator. So this is just a dimensional analysis. And in conformal field theory, because there is no other uh, mass scale, uh, this has to be true. On the other hand, the charge of the state of, is of course equal to the charge of the operator, which is given by J. So now, Let's assume that we take a large charge. So let, let's assume that this state with very large charge becomes in the infinite volume limit a state on the flat space. Because if you take the infinite volume limit, then SD minus one decompactify and you get a state on a flat space. So let, and let's assume that this state becomes the state in flat space with finite energy and finite charge density. So this is basically the only assumption we are going to make in order to get this expression. So if you make this assumption, so the energy of the state is given by uh, some finite energy density times Rd minus one, because this is the volume of the spatial slice. Whereas the charge is given by small j, which is charge density times Rd minus one, which is again the volume. Now we just like combine these two equations assuming that epsilon and j are order one, then uh, you immediately realize that the delta is dimension of the operator is r to d because of this extra factor of r and which is the same as j to d over d minus one. So under this assumption, uh, you can easily derive this scaling behavior. And this scaling behavior, as you can see, doesn't really depend on the detail uh, of the theory. And it just only depends on this assumption that the large charge state decompactifies into a state in flat space with finite energy and charge densities. And in fact, uh, this scaling was actually observed in a completely different system, uh, which is ADS uh, Reidner Nostrom black hole in the limit where uh, the charge is much, much larger than uh, uh, the gravitational constant coupling. And and this was discussed in, in this paper and they actually observed that also in that context, you get this charge behavior, this delta and J behavior. So, however, uh, I should say that, well, maybe some of you immediately noticed that this scaling behavior of the minimal dimension operator is clearly incorrect for superconformal field series because in superconformal field series, we know that there are BPS states whose dimensions scale linearly as J which is much, much smaller than this prediction. So what is wrong about this prediction? So the pr prediction, the part of the prediction, the uh, assumption that goes wrong is actually this assumption that this becomes a state in finite, uh, in, in infinite R1 to D minus one with finite energy density. And more precisely, if you consider large charge BPS states and then take the same decompactification limit, then you actually get a state on R D minus one comma D minus one, but with zero energy density, but with finite charge density. And the existence of such states is related to the fact that in SUSY series, supersymmetric theory, uh, the vac there is a flat direction in the vacuum. And you can, by going into the uh, flat direction, uh, 
you can actually give a finite dense charge density while keeping the vacuum energy to zero, to be zero. And, <clears throat> and in the case of uh, say n equals two super conform of use here in four dimensions, uh, this vacuum manifold uh, is often parameterized by Coulomb branch uh, VEV, uh, by which I mean that you can consider some expectation value of some uh, charged scalar, and that parameterizes the uh, like a flat direction. So, so roughly speaking, the physical picture is as follows. So, so this physical picture, well, with some modification, also applies to the general case. But here I am talking about BPS case, state and supersymmetric case. So the physical picture is that you take a large charge operator uh, in the cylinder. So this it gives you the large charge state. And because of this like a large charge state, uh, this field gets some like a non-trivial profile on a cylinder. And, but in the limit where you take R to infinity, this uh, like variation of the, or the oscillation of this profile is very like a slow. So if you zoom in one particular part, then it looks like this, uh, this looks like some uh, flat space state with some given uh, uh, fixed constant uh, scalar profile. And as you probably know that in the context of say cyber Witten theory or uh, N equals to uh, supersymmetric series, if you give a scale, scalar web to the uh, say SU2 uh, supersymmetric and mill theory, and then the gauge, uh, because of this uh, scalar web, the gauge symmetry gets fixed into uh, U1. And after the symmetry gets fixed to U1, the lower energy effective theory is described by what's called Coulomb branch effective field theory, uh, which is governed by cyber weight and prepotential. And, but in, but in addition, like in this case, like there can be also some higher derivative corrections uh, because we are not really on the flat space, but we are, uh, also considering some uh, limit of the curve manifold. But uh, the symmetry preserved uh, by this EFT is the same as the symmetry discussed in the context of cyber Witten theory. And you can constrain the higher derivative correction uh, or at least classify the higher derivative corrections. And using that idea of uh, you, describing the low energy theory using the uh, Coulomb branch EFT and plus higher derivative corrections. Uh, Helam and Maeda computed uh, <clears throat> the large charge expansion. So like uh, basically, they basically computed the next correction to this uh, linear growth predicted by BPS states. Uh, sorry, so they, they didn't, sorry, the, because of the BPS condition, this relation is fixed. But there are some other observables that you can compute using this low energy effective field theory. And that's what they computed. And they actually uh, did a computation for the two-point function of the chiral operators, uh, chiral and antichiral operators. And they uh, predicted this answer based on the effective field theory. And they, they showed that it, this prediction in the large J limit is in precise agreement uh, with the result coming from the supersymmetric localization uh, analyzed by these authors. So <clears throat> this is a, a basic story uh, about rank one in equals to super conformal field theory in 4D in the large charge limit. And so, lim but, but today's talk is mostly about like higher rank in particular large N. But before talking about that, uh, let me just make several side comments. <clears throat> so here uh, uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned that like in the supersymmetric theory, delta grows like uh, linearly and which is much, much smaller than J to D minus D minus one, D over D minus one. And that uh, basically predicts that there must be vacuum manifold. And the reason is very, uh, it's kind of simple because if you take this decompactification limit. And if you assume that delta scales much smaller than what's predicted by the large generic large uh, theories, then you end up with a state with energy equals zero, but J not equal zero. And so basically 
that this scaling predicts that in flat space, there must be some flat direction. So this direction, although it might be a bit complicated to make it fully regress, but it's kind of like reasonable to assume. However, uh, the other direction is a little bit more complicated. So you can ask like uh, whether the existence of the vacuum manifold in flat space, does it imply that the operator uh, scales linearly in the large J limit. And this is actually, I think, widely open. And this is an open question. But I just wanted to mention that recently uh, there was an interesting uh, conjecture by Aharoni and Pauti uh, in the context of uh, weak gravity conjecture. So the conjecture is that if you plot in generic general CFT, uh, if you plot the dimension delta as a function of U1 charge, then it must be convex. And as you can see that delta equal J is really marginal case in, uh, allowed by this convexity conjecture. And if this is true, and furthermore, the convexity conjecture is true, then uh, you can actually say that, so this property is only in the large J limit, but if the convexity is, conjecture is also true at finite J, then basically this implies that this linear behavior is, should also be true at finite J. So, if you can really uh, show this arrow, then it basically means that existence of vacuum manifold is related to this linear behavior of the delta, which is indicative of the BPS condition. And I think uh, this is probably something very nice to show, uh, but as far as I know, uh, there is no concrete result for that. And, but I just wanted to mention that in all the known example that this relation, the existence of that vacuum manifold implies this delta uh, linear behavior is correct. And another question we can ask is that more generally, can, can we show that in the large, if the dimension of the minimal dimension of operator scale like J to alpha in the large J limit, uh, does alpha need to be larger than one? So this is necessary in order to be consistent with the convexity conjecture. But I just wanted to emphasize that even this conjecture is not proven yet, as far as I know. Okay, so this was really just a side comment. And so, so what I want to really discuss today is about what happens for higher rank because this Helmer Maeda paper was mainly about rank one. So in higher rank, uh, not much has been explored. Although I know that there have been like there might be some ongoing work which might come up, uh, come out uh, uh, in in a few months. Uh, but the reason why not much has been explored is that there are some several difficulties. For example, uh, in the case of higher rank series, let's say like a high, uh, n equals four super meters with higher rank gauge groups, uh, there can be multi there are multi dimensional vacuum manifold, and depending on where you are on the vacuum manifold, uh, there can be a variety of Higgsian patterns. For example, in the case of SU2 gauge group, it just gets broken to U1. But in the case of SUN, it can be broken to U1 times SUN minus two, or like a U1 to N minus one. And the second problem is that classification of the supersymmetric higher derivative terms in the effective view theory gets much more complicated. So this is a little bit technical problem. And the third problem is that when you specify the large charge operator, in, in the case of SU2, uh, basically, there was no problem because there is only one operator for each uh, dim dimension, for each charge. On the other hand, uh, if you go to higher rank series, uh, then ca there can be multiple operators with the, uh, which, which are BPS and which have the same charge and dimensions. So if you really talk about large charge expand, if you really want to like, uh, develop large charge expansion or effective P series method, you first need to specify which operator you are talking about. And the last comment is that well, it's, it's more complex, uh, it's really technical, but I just wanted to mention that uh, getting the answer from localization results is much more complicated in higher rank series. So now uh, let's see that this problem one and three are actually intimately related in some simple toy model. So the toy model that I'm going to discuss is some complex matrix model. So this is a kind of like a simplest, like a zero dimensional uh, CFT uh, with U1 gauge group, with U1 charge. 
So I take this uh, complex matrix model, which are complex conjugate matrices, and then, and then I take the action to be Gaussian and I insert some operator with large charge and it's conjugate. And I assume that O is made out of Z and O bar is made out of Z bar. And this matrix model is not the Hermitian matrix model you are familiar with, but still you can actually write the uh, result in terms of eigenvalues. So this using the result by Ginevre, Ginevre uh, you can write this expression. And now let's consider uh, inserting some single trace operator. Let's say O equals trace Z to J. In terms of eigenvalue, you get this expression, which is Z K to J and summed over K. But because all the other parts are symmetric with respect to the exchange of these indices Ks, you can actually replace this sum uh, with n times z1 to j. And that has the same effect. So this basically shows that insertion of the single trace operator only gives a source term uh, for z1, but not for the other ones. So this basically suggests that if you just insert a single trace operator, uh, this uh, original UN symmetry, uh, which existed in the uh, Z and Z, uh, in the original pass in, the, in this matrix integral gets broken down to U1 times UN minus one. So this is a kind of analog of Higgs in, uh, in the context of N equals two uh, series. And now in order to get more complicated patterns, let's just consider double trace operator then. So, I consider trace Z1, Z to J1 and trace Z to J2. So then I can get this expression. So you might say now we have like a two uh, eigenvalues, maybe I get U1 times U1 times UN minus two. But that's actually not true because you need to carefully separate the sum into the one which have different indices and the one which have the same indices. And the one which have different indices indeed gives a web to uh, like a two different eigenvalues. So it corresponds to the symmetry breaking pattern or a Higgsing pattern, UN going to U1 squared times UN minus two. Whereas the one uh, in which N equals M, uh, you only giving a web to again, a single eigenvalue. So, so this suggests that uh, you get a Higgsing pattern, UN going to U1 times UN minus one. So this basically means that uh, this double trace operator induces the mixture of the Higgsing pattern rather than a single Higgsing pattern. So if you really want to project to this particular Higgsing pattern, then you need to subtract this extra piece. And in principle, one can try to generalize this and then try to get the operator dual to hit other Higgsing patterns, but this is in principle a bit complicated. This is in principle possible, but it's complicated in practice. But I, what I wanted to mention is that this toy model actually captures the essential features of N equals four CPM mills. And, and if you really want to be precise in the context of N equals four CPM mills, uh, you can do the following. Uh, so you take three point function of half BPS operators and you choose some, some operators for as a heavy operator and then you probe it by some uh, BPS single trace operator. So this can be always single trace, let's say for simplicity. And this three point function, because all of them are half BPS, we know that it's three level exact. So you can, for whatever, so for whatever choice of heavy operator, you can just compute it. On the other hand, it is also known that if you consider one point function of BP, half BPS operator, in particular, this operator on the Coulomb branch, that's also known to be three level exact thanks to supersymmetry. So if you want to really want to have a precise correspondence between different Coulomb branch uh, well, point and the heavy operators, then you can just compute both sides for various different trace and make sure that they agree. And this allows us to establish a dictionary between the large charge half BPS operator, which is OH, and the different Higgsing pattern in the Coulomb branch. And in particular, uh, in the if you want to uh, get the simple simplest Higgsian pattern u1 times un minus one, then you can show that the necessary oper heavy operator that you need to insert here is traced to some complex scalar to the j. Uh, and this is true at least in the large element. And of course, like you might ask, like this is 
uh, okay, so we basically like uh, computed observable explicitly and then just made a dictionary and what's good about it. Uh, however, this is actually nice because uh, so far this dictionary was established using the probe BPS operator, but then we can test this dictionary using the probe non BPS operator. So in considering three point function of two BPS and not one non BPS operator. And then also consider like a one point function of one non BPS light operator in some uh, particular Coulomb branch. And so this, in order to test the idea, we also need to have a, like a very concrete formula relating the two sides. And this is a formula we are putting forward. So we have two heavy operators here and here, and we uh, put them uh, like uh, antipodally separated uh, across the origin. And then we take a limit where two operators uh, becomes very, very large charged. And at the same time, uh, we take a limit that two operator becomes far apart. And if you take this limit, then like this operator creates some uh, field configuration. And, but if you take this limit and measure the field configuration near the origin, then it almost looks static. So you can approximate the Coulomb branch configuration. And the precise limit we need, one needs to take is, is this one. You take J and R to be infinite. At the same time, keeping this combination to be fixed. Okay. And so this is the uh, uh, correlation function at the conformal point, but in the presence of heavy operators. So here, these are probe operators. And on this side, we want to relate it to the Coulomb branch correlation function. And in particular, uh, we kind of take this expression. So we evaluate this uh, in the Coulomb branch where symmetry is broken from UN to U1 times UN minus one. And this theta integration basically like uh, integrate over all like one, one direction uh, on which we give a, a Coulomb branch back. So N equals four super mills have six scalars. And what this formula means is that like uh, we integrate over different uh, direction to which uh, we give a BEV to the scalar. And this relation was verified or more or less derived for, from the uh, analysis of the three point function of BPS operator. And in, in principle, this is checkable in perturbation theory and also uh, using some chiral algebra sector although the check is still in progress. And, and, and I should also mention that this could potentially be generalized to other fixing patterns. So this was the concrete formula that uh, on the field theory side. So now let me just talk about what is the holographic description. So for this particular case of uh, simplest uh, fixing pattern. So in n equals four super mills, if you take trace z to j and then send j to be very large, uh, this operator is known to be dual to what's called dual giant graviton. So what is the dual giant graviton? So the dual giant graviton is a spherical D3 brain whose word volume is given by RT times S3, uh, both of which is inside ADS5 space time. So in picture, it's like this. You have like a, some spherical D brain in global ADS and it's propagating in time. And the size of the D brain is controlled by this uh, ratio. And if you send J to be large, then this spherical D brain approaches the boundary. So now a uh, nice feature of this uh, holographic description is that it gives a geometrical understanding of the Coulomb branch effect field theory people are talking about in the context of large charge approximation. So if you take this limit, uh, this spherical D brain uh, gets bigger and bigger and it approaches the ADS boundary and it can be now approximated by some uh, flat D3 brain rather than spherical D3 brain. And then uh, what is nice about this is that this flat D3 brain has a very natural interpretation also holographically. So that is nothing but the description of the, of the Coulomb branch uh, corresponding to U1 times UN breaking down to U1 times UN minus one. And this brain is pro brain uh, describing the U1 part of U1 times UN minus one. 
So this basically gives you the geometrical understanding why the large charge limit is described by the Coulomb branch effective action from the holographic point of view. Thank and also, yes. okay, and in this context, uh, the DBI action that you get on this brain, it can be identified, plays the role of the large charge effective field theory people are talking about in the context of large charge expansion. Okay, so this is a one nice setup in which we can discuss uh, the connection between large charge, holography, and DBI action. Uh, is there any question about this part? Okay, so now let's proceed. So now uh, I'm going to, again, change the subject a little bit and then talk about uh, the recent paper which we put out this week, uh, which is about large charge uh, on the Wilson loop de defect CFT. But in order to introduce sub the subject, uh, let me just talk about another beautiful piece of work uh, regarding the large charge uh, expansion in superconformal field theory, uh, in particular rank one superconformal field theory in n equals two superconformal field theory, which was done by these authors. And they, what they analyze is that they analyze the extremal correlation, what's called extremal correlation function in rank one n equals two superconformal field theory. In particular, they analyze the two point function of Cairo and anti Cairo uh, operator uh, belonging to the Coulomb branch Cairo ring. And this correlation function uh, is nice because it's computable from localization using the deformed sphere partition function. And how do we do that? So the idea is very simple. In the rank one superconformal field theory, uh, this uh, chiral ring operator with charge J uh, can be simply given by a, a, at least like a, in the theory they considered, it, they are simply given by uh, like uh, take the minimal charge operator and then take a J's power. So this is the analog of the relation that you can write in the case of SU2 N equals for super mills. In the SU2 N equals for super mills, like a, the operator with charge J is given by this expression. But because of the SU2 trace relation, you can also write it in this way. And this is the basic reason why you can write in, uh, this kind of relation in the context of SU2 N equals for super mills. And now another useful fact is that if you take sphere partition function and take derivative with respect to the uh, gauge coupling constant, and then you can uh, bring down, sorry, then, uh, then you can bring down, uh, I hope you can hear, hear me still, right? Hello, can, can you, can you yeah, guys yeah, yeah, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Shota. Okay, okay, yeah, so because my, like, <laughs> one of the airports like lost the battery. So, okay, so let's continue. And, right, so, so if you take derivative with respect to the coupling constant, then uh, you basically bring down some, uh, uh, like a uh, action of the theory but because of the supersymmetry, it's related to bringing down uh, this uh, minimal charge operator. Well, more precisely, I should also write T bar and then put all one bar here. But the basic idea is that the derivative with the coupling constant is related to insertion of the minimal charge operator. So, so you might say that, okay, so you, you can just do J's time and then you get this like a two point function of large charge operator. However, this is not true. And this part was discussed in particular in this paper. And the reason why it's not true is that there is some non-trivial relation between the operator on S4 and the operator on R4. So what you really want, what we really want to insert is the operator in R4 with a fixed dimension, like I say, delta zero. However, if you consider operators on R4, because you can like uh, write some like a curvature, uh, uh, scalar curvature, uh, you can actually like uh, mix uh, operators with different dimension in R4. 
So, so if you write some like a random operator, which you might think that has a, like a definite dimension in S4, it typically is given by some mixture of complicated operators in flat space. So to resolve this mixing, uh, we base, one basically need to do the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So what's the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization? So the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, probably many of you already know, is a way, systematic way to construct orthogonal basis from a given set of vectors. For example, if you have only two vectors, it's very simple. You choose new vector you want to be the same as V1, and then U2 to be given by this combination. And you can easily see that this combination is also going to be one, where this is the scalar product. But nice thing about this uh, expression is that you can reorganize this into some determinants. So this is like one over in a product of V1 and V1. And this is just like a determinant. And using this expression, you can also compute the two point function of the newly defined vector. And that's again given by actually ratio of determinants. So determinant, in this case, the ratio between determinant of size one and determinant of size two. And this is also true for this, uh, for this uh, story of n equals two super conformal theory. So because of this, like uh, we basically end up with writing something like this. So the two point function is, okay, precisely speaking, it's a ratio, but the important part is it's given by some, some determinant. And where the a matrix element of the determinant is given by this expression. And now the observation made in this paper is that, so let's take this uh, sphere uh, partition function and in the SU2 theory or rank one theory, and then it's given by basically one complex integral. And then uh, if you take derivative with respect to tau and tau bar, then you are going to insert extra factor a to 2n, a, a bar to 2m uh, in this way. So now we have some uh, expression and in which each element is given by some powers. And probably if you know the matrix model literature, you would immediately recognize that this is very much similar to the Pandemon determinant. And indeed, uh, it's, you can actually use the, basically the same identity to write this whole determinant to the multiple integrals with the fundamental factor coming from this. So this is what they did. So they basically reformulated this uh, determinant into the matrix integral. But the interesting part here is that now the size of the matrix is given by J times J. So, and then uh, using this, you can basically re relate one of a J expansion uh, to the genus expansion, because now the size of the matrix model is related to the charge, one of a charge expansion. And you can use all the technology of the matrix model, like a spectral curve and topological recursion to obtain very precise prediction. And again, this work was done for rank one theory. And the generalization to higher rank is much, again, much more complicated. And this is because of the degeneracy of operator, because you can have like several different operators with a given charge, although there was important progress, uh, partial progress made in this paper. However, I should emphasize that, so this is not very much appreciated, but how, I, 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 but I wanted to emphasize that things simplify again in the large n limit because of the large n factorization. So very roughly, let me just tell you the answer. And so very roughly in the rank one formula, we have a determinant of like a derivative of the sphere partition function. On the other hand, if you want to write a large n formula and that formula takes a similar form, but now you need to replace the sphere partition function by F zero. What is F zero? So F zero is essentially you uh, take a sphere partition function and expand in the large n limit. In particular, like you take log and expand in the large n limit. And in the matrix model language, there is a, a leading piece which is called genus zero free energy. And if you just replace Z by the genus zero free energy, you automatically get the correct, roughly speaking, you automatically get the correct answer in the large n limit. And so, so this might sounds miraculous, 
but by the way, this is basically done, what's done in this paper, but this might sound miraculous, but what it really means is that in the large N limit, there is a kind of flat, clear uh, kind of classification of operators, single trace and double trace and so on. And it's actually very easy to uh, like uh, do the Gram-Schmidt for between single trace and multi-trace operator. And after doing so, like what remains is the diagonalization among the single trace operator and which can be done by computing this formula. Okay. So, and the nice thing about this large N formula is that you can apply to a variety of setups, uh, including defect conformal field theory. Furthermore, uh, this large N formula, so again, this large N formula is given by J times J matrix, uh, has a often has a natural holographic interpretation. And in particular, uh, as I should discuss later, uh, well, shortly, uh, this, the spectral curve of this large N, large J matrix coincides with some, well, does have some holographic interpretation. Okay, so, but, uh, so let me pause a little bit if, to, and ask if there are questions. Yeah, I, I, I had a quick question. Are you going to elucidate this uh, holographic interpretation or is it? Uh... Yeah, oh, I'm going to give one uh, example and then explain like what is the holographic interpretation. Thank you. Okay. Right, so so the, the example that I'm going to talk about is the example that I worked on, which is some supersymmetric subsector on the half BPS Wilson loop. So, so in N equals four SuperMLs, it is very well known that uh, there is a circular half BPS Wilson loop which preserves half of the supersymmetry. And that is the Wilson loop, generalization of the Wilson loop, which couples also to the scalar. And nice thing about this Wilson loop is that because it's circular, it, it defines a, like 1D defect to conformal field theory. And another nice feature is that there is some nice topological subsector. Uh, so it's a bit like a, a chiral algebra for n equals to super conformal field theory, and in which uh, you can uh, compute correlation function uh, exactly using the localization. And to be a bit more precise, like uh, the, this sector is defined in the following way. So you take circle and then you correlate which operator you insert with the position of the uh, operator insertion. So if you want to insert the uh, operator at position theta, you choose particular linear combination of the scalar field. Then if you choose this combination, you can show by supersymmetry that this correlation function is independent of, of the position. And furthermore, you can show that it preserves some scalar uh, supercharge. And another nice thing is that you can actually compute it from localization. And again, uh, because now we are having some, so, so the idea is very simple to the previous case. We start from deformed uh, circular Wilson loop partition function and take derivatives. And again, uh, what we really want to compute is the correlation function uh, in some flats on the flat uh, or straight line uh, Wilson loop. But because what we can naturally compute from localization is the one from uh, on the circle, there can be some non trivial mixing, and you need to do the Gram Schmidt analysis. So, shorter could ask that? Yes. Yes. So, yes. there is this I54 term, uh, just a bit, uh, can you remind because it's a bit surprises me. This phi tilde has I54 in your formula. Why, why do you need it? Uh, well, we need to have some, uh, like a null vector, right? So if you just have cosine theta and sine theta, that's not null vector. Uh, I, okay. I'm just saying, yeah. Well, I think it's, it, it looks differently because I'm using different convention, but basically it's- Ah, yeah, way. that's because you are not using these, it's real fields, okay. So yeah, yeah. I see. <laughs> okay, so, right. So this is what you have. And, okay, so, yeah, so. And then we basically just like uh, do the same analysis what I just 
described for n equals two super conformal field theory with rank one. So you compute the determinant, and then a determinant can be expressed as the uh, as the, like a multiple integrals. And as a result, again, you get this uh, natural J times J matrix model like expression. And it's good to know that Kolev is in the audience because like this matrix model expression, although I wrote here my paper uh, because I derived it from localization, actually this matrix model was derived first from a completely different method based on integrability already back in 2012. And what we did in this uh, 2018 paper is to re-derive re this from localization and the Gram-Schmidt analysis. And however, uh, in these two papers, we mainly discuss like a, this two-point function, like, and we never like seriously discuss like inserting some other operators. Well, we did discuss a little bit in this paper, but not much. And it, furthermore, we didn't really like uh, try to use this for the large charge expansion before. So that's what we basically did uh, in the paper which appeared last uh, this week. So now we insert, we have some very large charge operator and in that, on top of it, we have light operators. So let me just remind you that previously, this two point function itself was uh, looking like the partition function of some J times J matrix model. And now the question is what happens if you probe it by some, lo some local operators, some light operators? And the conclusion is simple. The conclusion is that you just need to include this extra factor uh, where each uh, Q is given by some uh, polynomial of the eigenvalue and which in the integrability context called uh, Q functions. But what's uh, interesting is like uh, the detail structure here. So you, what you need to do is to multiply all these polynomials, Q functions for each independent eigenvalue. And then afterwards you sum over J. What does it mean from the matrix model? It means from the matrix model that you are inserting some, like in this emergent matrix model whose size is J times J, it means that you're actually inserting a single trace operator in this matrix model. And this correlation function or expectation value of this single trace mat operator in a matrix model can also be analyzed using the techniques of the large charge, sorry, large n matrix model. And in particular, uh, it's very suitable for analyzing the limit, uh, which corresponds to the usual to fifth limit in the matrix model. But in the usual to the, the thing is that the usual truth limit in the usual matrix model uh, corresponds to some funny limit in which you send j to infinity and the coupling, the foot coupling to infinity, but the coupling over j to be fixed. Sure. And this is big, yes. Um, here, both the heavy and the light particles are insertions are in the topological sector, yes? Yes, yes. Everything is in the topological section. So it's not like a real four-point function with cross ratios and so on. It's not a real four-point function cross ratio. It just gives you some uh, uh, four-point function evaluated at particular cross ratio. Yeah. Okay. It's really like yeah. It's like it's indeed like a analog of this yeah Drucker plevka con configuration for the <laughs> correlation function without insertion without Wilson loop. And the, and the queues, que, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, and queues are orthogonal, right, uh, with respect to the measure. Yeah, queues are orthogonal to the with respect to the measure, but uh, queues are also orthogonal to with respect to the measure when you have only single, uh, like, uh, integration variable. But now, like, we have a generalization of the, like, um, of the measure, which is multiple integrals. Okay. So, right, so let me just say that when, when you set j to, z, uh, j to zero, then this whole expression just collapsed to, uh, sorry, when you, okay. Yeah, when you set j to zero, then this whole expression collapsed to like uh, the product overlap of the a single integral of the Q functions. Okay. So, so, so by doing this, we can basically compute this correlation function. 
And now uh, we want to kind of like reproduce this or extend this result from the holography and also ask what is the interpretation of the spectral curve of this like emergent matrix model that I alluded to before. So to talk about it, let's just remind us like what is the holographic description. So the holographic description, now let's just first remind us uh, what is the holographic description of the Wilson loop without insertion. For the case of Wilson loop without insertion, uh, it's it's best to use the conformal map uh, and then like a map this like a hemisphere a worksheet which describe the dual of the circular Wilson loop to this global ADS picture in which you have like a two quarks here and here. And then there is like a worksheet, worksheet stretching between them. So, and then, uh, <clears throat> so what we now need to do is to uh, insert some large charge operator here. Uh, so sorry, here and here which corresponds to inserting some large charge state at infinity, past infinity and future infinity. And this basically deforms the string worksheet solution. And you get some non-trivial uh, excited state classical string solution, which was identified by Miwa Yonea in a particular case and generalized in this paper by uh, Kolea and Amit. And this explicit solution is known and written in terms of complicated elliptic function. and uh, I'm not going to show you the explicit form, but if you map it to circle, then the, roughly speaking, if you don't have any heavy operator insertion, then it just gives you ADS2, Euclidean ADS2 surface. But now we have some like a curvature concentrated around the insertion point of the operator. And then, then what we want to do is to like put some light operator, a light vertex operators, and evaluate their correlation functions. So our limit, uh, as I said before, is to take large J limit and large uh, two coupling limit with ratio fixed, which means that one of a J correction is the same as one of a G correction, one of the two coupling correction. And one of a G is basically H bar for the quantization of the semi-classical string worksheet in, uh, in ADS5 space time. So basically by analyzing uh, non-planar corrections in this emergent matrix model, we can learn about the quantization of the semi-classical string. And in the leading large J limit, it's very simple. We just need to write down the expression for the light vertex operators, and then just like evaluate that on the classical solution. So this is really just a classical solution. You, if you know the solution, you can immediately compute it. So this is what we did in this paper. But what's more interesting is the subleading correction, uh, which is the topic of the paper that's going to appear. In the subleading correction, we basically need to compute the propagator in this non-trivial classical string worksheet background. So you compute a, like a green function on this uh, complicated macroscopic solution, and then use the green function to compute like a connect to, to vertex operator insertion. And let me just remind you that this looks like a two-point function but the, the solution itself described two heavy operators. So actually this described the four point function. And I should also mention that unlike the localization computation, the final answer can be performed for generic like a cross ratio. So this is going to be a gen, like complicated function of the cross ratio. <clears throat> now, uh, so this computation uh, relies on the computation of the propagator. And this, comp this propagator has actually like, a, this is a just a math mathematical trick, but it has a nice expansion uh, in terms of discrete sum. So let me just briefly explain how it works. So, so this, you know, to compute the propagator, you basically expand the worksheet action around some classical solution and read off the uh, quadratic piece. So if it's a free, free boson, you get something like this, but because we have a non-trivial solution, this operator is a bit complicated. But let's write uh, this operator in this way, like uh, you separate the time piece and then a space piece. And using this operator, green function is defined by this functional equation. Uh, basically, like I'm just saying that the green function is inverse of the uh, quadratic part of the action. Now, uh, using this Fourier transformation trick, we can rewrite, we can always write some uh, integral representation of this uh, propagator. And 
in which this, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in which uh, like a things in integrand factorizes into two parts and each piece uh, satisfies time independent, uh, like a differential equation. Yeah, by the way, I, I missed some funk. So here, I also need to include some A of K here. And so, so this basically reduces the problem to the problem of solving some like ordinary differential equation. And, and this you can explicit, explicitly solve using some uh, elliptic function. But what's important here is that the, this expression of integral over K, you, see originally it is again like given by the integral, but you can deform the contour and pick up contribution from poles. And that gives you some expression like this uh, with some free factor as well. And, and I just wanted to make connection with the first part of the talk. So in that, to, if I were to make connection, this is a bit like quasi-normal expansion, like quasi normal mode like expansion of the two-point function. So now, uh, given this expression, you can ask what is the physical meaning of each pole that you see when you deform the contour. And to, so in the remaining uh, five minutes, let me just explain uh, the physical meaning. So the physical meaning, so, so this is where uh, there is, uh, we make contact with the holographic and the matrix model description. So describe it, the physical meaning, let me just remind, uh, I need to like uh, say something about uh, integrability of ADS5 times this five string. So string sigma model in ADS5 times this five is known to be classically integrable. And by which here, uh, by which I mean that there is some solution generating techniques and you can actually classify solution or explicitly write down the solution once you are given some uh, what's called spectral curve, which is uh, basically hyper elliptic curves in, in simple cases. And so this spectral curve encodes various information. For example, like there is in some simple cases, there is a systematic way to construct a solution, classical solution, once you are given spectral curve. And in addition, uh, you can read off all the higher conserved charges of, charges of the classical string solution from the spectral curve. And the precise identification is that you do some period integral of the spectral curve, and that's going to give you the conserved charge. And for this, uh, like a heavy operator inserted Wilson loop solution, uh, the spectral curve of the string was uh, discussed already in this Gromov server paper. And they already made an uh, important uh, observation that this spectral curve coincides with the spectral curve of the large J matrix model that you can get from the localization. So, but this was kind of a nice coincidence in the context of some uh, protected observable, which can, you can compute from the large J matrix model. But the main punchline of this part of the talk is that on the string theory side, uh, the same spectral curve actually controls other like quantities beyond topological sectors. So this is a very interesting point because the, this spectral curve from the matrix model point of view, this spectral curve was obtained from analyzing the localization which control the BPS quantity. But if you trans, and this turned out to coincide with the spectral curve of the string, and that spectral curve uh, actually controls non-BPS quantity as well. So let me just, uh, so this is uh, still uh, a bit work in progress. So I just want to show you one slide, how it works. Uh, so the idea is the following. So so we now compute the one over J correction, which I, uh, which is given by this like a green function that I described, and then uh, decompose the green function into quasi-normal expansion, quasi-normal mode expansion, which is a discrete sum. And if you analyze carefully uh, this expansion, you first immediately notice that it actually coincides precisely with the conformal block decomposition. So this is nothing but the uh, dimension of the operator. 
And this is nothing but the three point function squared. And another thing to notice is that, so this sum came from some position of the poles, like a picking up, deforming the contours and picking up the position of, uh, picking up the poles. But the position of the pole turned out to coincide or like a, can be summarized into some nice uh, expression, like a some function equals to n times pi. And this function uh, turned out to be the function, uh, what people call uh, quasi momentum, which basically controls the analytic structure or which basically determines the structure of the spectral curve. And in particular, these poles corresponded to what's called like a degenerate point uh, of the spectral curve. So, and so what I mean by this is that if you draw the uh, spectral curve uh, for this uh, matrix model or classical string, you discover that there are two macroscopic branch cut and at one branch cut, you get like px equal pi, and the other branch cut, you get px equal minus pi. But on top of that, you have a bunch of like uh, points, uh, infinitely many points in which at which uh, px equal n pi is satisfied. And in the paper uh, um, by Kole and his collaborators, uh, they analyze a, a kind of quantization of some spectral curve. Uh, in the context of closed string spectrum. And they observe that uh, these points basically control the fluctuation of the, or quantization of the spectral curve. So what we are doing here, what we are seeing here is uh, something very similar, but now in the context of four point function. So in, and what's nice here is that like in the context of four point function, you can also write some express, expression for this three point function square. And that's also given by some quantity defined naturally on the spectral curve. So, so far, this is like a translation and observation, but it's kind of telling us that uh, spectral curve that you got uh, from the classical string, which coincided with the matrix model, actually knows a lot more about the BPS sector, and it actually also controls non-BPS quantity as well. So let me uh, just conclude because I run, ran out of time. Uh, sorry, I think this is a conclusion of some different talk, so I need to erase this part. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, so, so the conclusion is the following. So. I emphasize that if you consider a large charge BPS operator for higher rank super conformal field theory, there is some degeneracy and because of that, it's difficult. But there, at least in the large M limit, like you can make some precise identification about which operator corresponds to which fixing pattern. And it tries Z to J corresponding to uh, what's called dual giant graviton, uh, which is spherical D brain. And this spherical D brain basically geometrically realizes the large charge effective field theory. And the second point is the large charge boost on the Wilson loop defect CFD uh, can be expressed in terms of um, emergent matrix model. And this emergent matrix model gives you a spectral curve which coincided with the string. And of course, the big open question, uh, which is a bit unrelated to the, these two, uh, is what happens if you consider a large charge operator for which the dimension of the operator scale again square? And that would correspond to something like black holes or bubbling geometry. Okay. All right. So let's uh, all unmute ourselves again and thank uh, Shota for part two. Loading in however form. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, open the floor for questions now. Uh, just unmute yourself and uh, and uh, ask. Oh, I can always ask if, if you want. <laughs> I, I I want I want. <laughs> well, I mean a bit technical question. So your uh, resolvent uh, in principle will also have some polarization indices, right? And uh, those probably aligns with uh, the fact that there are also different types of uh, excitations on the curve or you just study so two sector at the moment or oh, right right so 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 our, so our results also have 
yeah, our results can be written also for the other sectors. But this correspondence with the spectral curve so far we uh, explored only for this uh, simple sector. Thanks. So I, I had a question regarding uh, the um, case where J scales like n squared and whether, yeah. uh, you know, the, with black holes, you, you want that and you also want to see that there's some sort of large degeneracy of states that also goes right, right. like e to the n squared somehow. Is this out of uh, technical control at this stage in the large uh, J expansion or large charge expansion? Yeah, yeah. I. I... <laughs> I would say so. Be a um, question or theme in these talks. Right, right. Because like normally when people write the large charge effective action, it's just some simple like a scalar field theory, which doesn't come with the uh, entropy. Of course, I guess you can imagine writing them down something like hydrodynamics. But then like it's a bit like, a, well, that's what you expect, I guess, because it's a black hole and then there is a horizon. But, but I'm not Mm -hmm. Is part of the issue that the large n factorization breaks down in that limit and many of the underlying assumptions don't hold of the analysis? What's the technical? Uh, right. So the technical, so the, the typical large charge. So, okay. So the one thing is that like the scaling that, that I mentioned in the beginning is also true uh, in the, for the black hole, but this is just like a dimensional analysis. And then if you want to start writing some effective Lagrangian, and as soon as you start like uh, putting some finite number of fields and then treat it in the usual way of effective field theory, then it doesn't give you any entropy. And because like there is an underlying assumption that there is a no degeneracy and then there is a vacuum and then you can just construct the state by exciting some scalars. And so I need to, so I guess like we need to change that and go to something like hydrodynamics. And I, and it's, I think it's just not explored much. Uh, there is a nice paper uh, in the, con not in the context of large but just in the context of the heavy operator by Luca de la Cretas, uh, which tried to like uh, relate the hydrodynamics to the conformal field theory with large, large, large dimension sector. I think we, basically just need to kind of generalize it to uh, this context. Thank you. Perhaps another one like related to what the ask. So uh, localization in principle, you know, for finite and as well, right? So it's just different types of, instead of base series, there's are some uh, polynomials, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So uh but then uh, will it give you some modified generalized type of matrix model or it just doesn't work at some point oh okay okay so so the localization i know how to do it completely either in the large n limit or in the su2 sector uh both of both in both cases like uh, the degeneracy is simple in, because in SU2, there is only one operator. In SUN, I can just use a single trace, double trace uh, distinction. And for other cases, actually, like I can do uh, like a case by case analysis. If you want to like uh, know some charge four operator, the correlation function of charge four, I can just do the Gram Schmidt and then get mm -hmm. the answer. But uh, I don't know like a nice way of writing the final answer into the matrix model. So it doesn't reduce to kind of find an orthogonal polynomials problem anymore find it then. right uh yeah i that's true i think that's true more questions i guess they can be about uh, part one and two um, So if, if there's no more questions, 
let's all thank Shota once more and I'll keep the Zoom open for a, a few more minutes of informal discussion, but I, I will stop the recording. So thank you again uh, yeah, thank you. Shota, for doing this, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'll stop the recording now.